Greetings folks, Professor Fiore here, and it's time for some more Guitar Fuzz. If you haven't already seen it, there is a preceding video talking about guitar fuzz circuits, stomp boxes, whatever you want to call them. Those things that make your guitar sound that special sort of way. People always looking for tone. So why another video on guitar fuzz? Why not? I mean, if you think about it, there's probably as many tweaked circuits as there are for uh, the number of guitar players you have, right? I mean, everybody has their own idea of what that perfect tone is. Maybe somebody says, you know, I want to I wanna cross between, you know, Robert Fripp and Alan Holdsworth, um, you know, on the first UK album, with, uh, you know, a little bit of uh, Frank Zappa playing Rat Tamago, you know, whatever. And if you don't know who those people are, well, that's your homework assignment. Go look up Robert Fripp and Alan Holdsworth um, and Frank Zappa, of course, but whatever. So, you know, what I want to look at here is something that's maybe a little off the beaten path. Um, something with a little bit maybe more flexibility, as you're going to see. The idea here is actually pretty simple, which is we're going to take an existing circuit, what we looked at in the preceding video, a basic distortion, you know, stomp box kind of circuit, and then instead of just cranking the gain up to get more and more distortion, we're going to add something to it so that we can blend back in the original undistorted sound. So you can kind of think of this as mixing together the pure unadulterated sound and the distorted sound. Now that can, under certain circumstances, give you interesting sorts of results. You can actually get some more clarity in the sound if you have something that is low frequency heavy, bass rich. You know, some uh, bass players will use distortion, but if you use heavy distortion on a bass, you know, the actual bass, the heaviness of it, kind of goes away and it's all harmonics. It's all this distortion harmonics. So by mixing that uh, original signal back in, you can get a, you know, a different kind of quality. So that's what we're going to look at. So let's go back to our circuit. And this first thing, there's three op amps here, but I want to focus first here. This is essentially the circuit we looked at in the preceding video. Now I've altered this so that it only uses um, instead of a single 9-volt power supply, it uses a plus and minus 9-volt power supply. And the reason why I did that is it gets rid of all of the extra biasing components that we needed. So to run on a single polarity power supply, we need a whole bunch of extra resistors and capacitors. That was going to make this circuit, trying to explain it, kind of busy. So I just wanted to just kind of zero in on what we're, what we're looking at in this particular thing. In other words, what's new. If you really wanted to, you could redesign this. Uh, to run on a single a single 9 volt battery. Um, a dual is nice though, you know, you don't have to worry about capacitors and things like that. So, But in any case, if you look at the preceding video, you will basically see this circuit. Quick overview of what it is. Um, we've, we've got a series parallel non-inverting feedback scheme over here. Here's your RF at 1 meg. Your RI is the combination of this 4.7K and whatever this pot is set up for. In other words, this is wired up as a rheostat. So if we bring the wiper arm all the way up to here, this is shorted out, and the gain will be one meg over 4.7K, that quantity plus one. And that's gonna get you a gain of around 200, which is an awful lot of gain. On the other hand, if you bring the wiper arm all the way down to here, you've got a meg plus 4.7, um, so basically, one meg over about a meg plus one, in other words, gain of two, right? So not much gain at all. So the amount of gain that we have basically tells us how big the output signal is going to be, and that ultimately is going to be limited by this uh, pair of parallel diodes. These are going to clip off the uh, clip, uh, excuse me, clip, <laughs> clip off the peaks of the output signal at around seven tenths of a volt. All right. Normally, we would just run that out maybe through a, um, an output buffer, and that would be what we have, okay? We would probably have right, this over here for the distortion, the amount of distortion we have, and then a potentiometer here that 
potentiometer out here that you would tap off to get the total uh, output level, right? The volume level. That would be typical. So what we're going to do instead, right? We have this same circuit. What we're going to do instead is we're going to take some of the original input signal and we're going to run it through a buffer. And I'll explain why I have a buffer here in just a sec. But we're going to take that and we're going to run it into this pot, which then feeds the output buffer. Now what's going to end up happening is you can just think, because this is a unity gain buffer, right here, this is whatever the input signal, right? So you've got the input signal here and you've got the distorted signal over here. So end result, by tapping off uh, on this pot with this wiper arm, you either, if the wiper arm is all the way up here, you either get the full distorted signal, or if it's all the way down, if the wiper arm is all the way down here, you get the full undistorted input signal. If it's somewhere in the middle, well, you get a little bit of both, you know, depending. So you can think of this as a sort of a blend control, how much distortion versus how much original signal, right? This is a little bit different than just turning down the distortion because this is level induced, all right? So you can crank this up and get a ton of distortion, but then sort of dial that back as a percentage. So in other words, the amount of harmonics that you generate becomes a function of this, but how big they are, what their amplitude is relative to the fundamental and the other original harmonics is a function of this, right? So you have a little bit more flexibility here than just having, you know, a distortion control, right? You can play it back and forth with this. All right, so it's probably obvious why we would have an output buffer, right? Who knows what the load out here is going to be? So you want to isolate right this pot from what's going on here but why do i have a buffer over here well the very simple reason is because the question becomes what is the output impedance of this source now if you built this in the simulator it really wouldn't make any difference whether you had the the buffer here or not you would get pretty much the same result as um, without it as with as with it right but when you actually hook up a guitar, it'll be different because the source impedance back here ideally is zero, zero ohms, which is the same case for this unity gain buffer. But a real guitar, this output impedance can be pretty high, right? You know, there can be thousands of ohms plus a very large inductance, meaning that that total impedance is a function of frequency. That can do really weird things as far as the, the blend control. For the blend control to work properly looking back, right, looking back towards the distortion or looking back here towards the original signal, you want those output impedances to be very, very small in order for this voltage divider effect to work correctly, right? If this is a coming right straight back, this is actually high impedance and the blend will not work correctly, right? You can do a, uh, like a superposition on this. If this is a very low impedance, which it would be, I mean, you've got these diodes shorting out ideally. Um, you do have this 470 ohm current limiting resistor, um, but you're still gonna have a relatively small value compared to the size of the pot, right? So you would think, okay, if, if the wiper arm is all the way down here, obviously you're getting a full input signal, but then you have to think in terms of, well, what's the divider out here, okay, for the distortion signal? Well, this is a very low impedance and then you've got this essentially this 10k or a big chunk of the 10k before you come in so that's a huge voltage divider effect flip side if the wiper arm is all the way up right you're getting the full signal out here but this is a very low output impedance so exact opposite happens right this sees this very low output impedance driving basically like a 10k resistor because again the pot wiper arm is up here and then you know, you basically, on the other side of that, using superposition, you see the output impedance of this, which is very small. So that divider between, you know, 10K-ish and very, very small, you lose all your input signal, right? All of the undistorted input signal gets lost. So that's why we need this buffer here, right? Now, I'm showing a TL071, which is a nice you know, bifet op amp. You can make this with a TL074, which is a quad version of this, all right? 
Um, what do you want to use that fourth op amp for? I don't know. Who knows what, right? Make a blinky light. Make another input buffer. Make another output gain stage. Whatever works, all right? So that's kind of nice because you have you just have the one dual inline package and you could set that up, all right? So let's do um, let's do a couple simulations here and see what actually ends up happening. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start the pot over here at a fairly high value, right? 90%. So the wiper arm's way up here, right? We're not getting very much resistance here, so we're going to get a fair amount of gain, which is going to produce a fair amount of distortion, fair amount of overload. And we'll start with the blend pot right at 50%. So what we're going to what we're going to see here is 50/50 distorted signal and input signal. All right? We'll see what see what the heck comes out of here. Okay? All right. So we'll come up here, we'll do a little transient analysis. Uh, let's see 0 to 10 milliseconds will work for what we have because they have a 500 hertz input. We'll see a few cycles of that. Let's move this over here so we can see it. And or, or we see three uh, waveforms. Let's put a legend out here. So the distortion signal is the maroon. You can see that's definitely squared up. Okay. V in is this you know nice sine wave, and then V load, of course, is this thing in the middle. You might see this a little bit better if we separate out the curves. Okay. So here's our input, nice sine wave. Here's the distorted output, which is very heavy, or very square. And you can see the load is literally the combination, right? It has the steep sides of the distorted bit, but it's not as flat at the top and the bottom um, as the distorted signal, right? It's a little bit more roundy because we've got the, this addition of the, the tops and the bottoms of the sine wave, right? The original input sine wave. So we have something kind of in between them. This is not going to sound as, uh, as bright, as harsh as the pure distorted signal. Right? It's going to be, have a little bit more clarity, but it's harmonically richer than the original signal. Right? We've added harmonics here because of the distortion. So it does have a different tone. The timbre has changed. Now we turn around and we change the blend over here. Right, so let me bring the blend up to 90%. And we'll run that again. And you can already see what's happening here, right? So there's the distortion again. Here's our input signal. And in between, you can see the load. And you can see, okay, it's, it's mostly the distorted signal, right? You can see how it's really tracing out that distorted signal. But not quite as flat, right? If you really zoom in on this area, it's not quite as, as flat at the top, okay? You can see that, all right? So the, the distortion is not identical. All right, let's do one more, which will be to send the blend pot the other way. Obviously, if you set this at zero, you should get the identical signal from the input. We'll have completely um, blended out the distortion signal. Badoink. Okay, so same sort of deal, right? Big distortion signal, and you can again see here between the two greens, the inner one is the ideal sine wave, and then the something closer to a Kelly green instead of an olive green is um, the, the blend, right, the, the output signal. And let's just separate those curves, and you can see, all right, you know, this is not, just looking at it, you can tell this is not a perfect sine wave, right? There is still a little bit of distortion in here. And you can see, like, right in these areas here, you know, where it starts to break away, you don't have that nice smooth transition that you do on the sine wave. It's a little chunky, right, because of the very hard edge on the uh, distorted signal. Right? So kind of cool. We take our original circuit, and instead of just making more or less of that, we do this idea of blending it back with the original signal. Now, if you're thinking, well, what if I just change the distortion? All I'm going to say is build this circuit and try it. 
Try to get the same exact waveform that you would get at a certain distortion level um, versus having a, a, a higher or lower distortion level and the blend. You're going to find that the combination of adjusting the distortion and the blend gets you waveforms that just adjusting the distortion pot won't get you. You have greater flexibility here. Right? Of course, you got more knobs to twiddle, and sometimes that's just what people like to do. You know, it's fun. Okay, so questions, comments, put them down below the video. Um, I'll answer them as needed. Okay, and until next time, this is Professor Fiore saying, have some fun. Remember, science plus art equals fun. Take care.